this Kaplan ACT bootcamp. I'm Kaplan instructor Stephanie, and I am joined by my fantastic colleague and friend Heather. And we are about to give you a lot of information about the ACT, how it works in the university admissions process, what are some strategies you can use to tackle it, and what are some of the core concepts that you need to know. So uh, hopefully I see a lot of you here joining us in the chat, that is fantastic. Let's take a look at our agenda for today. So the first thing you want to, or we're gonna, first thing we're gonna talk about is just the ACT. What is it, what's on it, how is it structured? I'm then going to cover some Kaplan ACT strategies as well as some content information for you. And finally, at the end, we'll conclude with how to earn a higher score and what are some of those tips for success that I know I'm sure you want to take away from this session. Now, a couple things to know. Uh, we will be giving away some ACT resources at the end of this, so make sure at some point you follow that link that Petrus just added into the chat below so that you can be entered into that. And if you have any questions throughout this session, do let us know in the chat either about the ACT or about something that I'm talking about here on camera. I'll be able to address some of those questions here on camera and those that I can't, Heather will also be answering there for you in the chat. So we wanna make sure that you leave this session with all of your questions answered. All right, so uh, Yusuf has a great question already, which is what is the difference between the ACT and the SAT? Well, I'm gonna talk about some of the similarities first. One of the similarities is that they both will contribute a large part to your university admissions application. Now, of course, they're not the only thing involved in university admissions, things like your GPA, the courses that you've been taking, um, those are all part of your admissions package as well. But a low score can be detrimental to the ability to get accepted into the schools that you're looking at. So you wanna make sure that you have a, a high SAT or ACT score. Most universities accept either one. So you do want to be kind of putting your effort into the test that you feel you're more comfortable with, that you're more confident on, and that allows you to showcase your talents the best. So of course, a, a super a high score doesn't guarantee admission either, but a higher score does give you an opportunity to have that admissions committee look over the rest of your application and give it the attention that it deserves. Okay. Now here's how the ACT is structured. This is a little bit different from the SAT. Um, now the ACT starts with an English test. It's 75 minutes long and it's 45 minutes in length. This is going to cover things like standard English conventions, as well as things like being consistent with tone, transitions, and the overall structure of writing. Uh, this is very similar to an SAT. Uh, where you're gonna have a writing and language component. Now here's the biggest difference between the ACT and the SAT. It has to do with math. On the ACT, math is 60 questions in 60 minutes. You have about a minute per question. You are allowed to use a calculator for every single question. I see a lot of you have the same question about the ACT and the SAT, so I'll kind of incorporate some of that as I go through this ACT structure. Now, the SAT, you have a part where you don't get a calculator. Um, you also have math accounting for 50% of your score. On the ACT, math is only worth 25% of your score. So that's gonna be a big difference. If you find that you are very strong in math and you want these tests to reflect that, the SAT will give 50% of your score towards your mathematical abilities. If maybe math isn't a strength of yours um, and you want a few more straightforward math questions, then the ACT math structure is going to better showcase those abilities. It's only 25% of your score and ACT math tends to be a bit more straightforward in terms of how it's taught in math classes. Um, and you can see some of the concepts here, very strong in algebra. ACT math also has a lot more geometry than the SAT. Um, ACT also has more trigonometry. So geometry and trigonometry, if those are areas that you're feeling kind of really good at, then you will see a lot more geometry questions on the ACT. You'll see about four math trigonometry questions, right triangle trigonometry, um, sine, cosine, that sort of thing, um, as well as some data analysis and statistics problems. Now, you'll get a break after the math test, and then you have a 35 minute reading test. This is another kind of difference between the two, uh, the two exams. Um, on the SAT, you have over an hour for reading. On the ACT, you have just shy, just a little over half an hour. So it goes much faster throughout the reading test on the ACT, 
But ACT reading focuses largely on plucking details out of the text. What did the text say? What, what's a fact here? What's a fact there? And you just find that information in the test structure. The SAT requires you to do a bit more of the integration of ideas. Now, you can see integration of ideas is also a question type you'll see on the ACT, but you just won't see as many of them. And finally, the ACT has a science test. This is completely different from the SAT. The SAT doesn't have this at all. The ACT has a science test, which is largely analyzing graphs, charts, and figures, seeing how different data can support or does or does not support a hypothesis, and coming up with conclusions based on the data that's there. So it's not a science content test. You're not going to be tested on science facts. So you don't need to like take a biology course or take a chemistry class but you will need to understand how to read graphs, um, how to read data, look at some results of an experiment, and see whether or not it supports a given outcome. All right, so, so that's kind of how the ACT is structured. Now, the ACT is scored on a bell curve. What this means is that you are being compared to other students who have taken the ACT. It's based on the percentile of students that you did better than. So the percentage of students who you scored better than gives you your percentile. It's not based on the percentage of questions you answered right. Now, of course, those two things are going to be related, right? If you answer more questions correctly, you will do better than more students. But there's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation between the number of questions you get right or wrong and your ACT score. It has to do with how many questions other students got right or wrong and where you kind of fall in line. So you can see here the median score, that mathematical average is about 20. So that's the average score. 50% of students do better than that. 50% of students get a score less than 20. Every I mean, that's that is how 20 is defined. Now, if this shifts upwards, if suddenly everyone's getting a 26, well, then it's just going to shift back down again. So it's scaled based on how everyone else is, um, is scoring. And so these are quite like, tightly clustered. You can see just getting a few more questions correct can move you up over that bell curve pretty significantly. So I see some of you are asking for some of these strategies. Well, let's talk about them because that is what's going to enable you to leapfrog over thousands of other students. So let's talk about some of those Kaplan methods and some of the content you're going to see on test day. Now, let's first start with the ACT English test. This is the very first test you're going to see. Now, here's our Kaplan method for ACT English. You're going to read the passage, the entire passage, not just bop, 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 boop around from underline section to underline section. But as you encounter a question, you're going to stop. So you're going to read, read, read until you hit a question, and then you're going to stop, and you're going to identify the issue that's being tested. Now, you can, you can know what the issue is in a couple of different ways. One way is to practice, to prepare, and to have some instruction on what's on the ACT, and you'll know exactly what is and what isn't tested on test day. So, so one way is just to know what's on the test. For instance, things like commas and subject verb agreement and wordiness, those are issues that are tested. Things like, do I think it sounds right? Could I make it sound better? Do I think this is interesting or could I rewrite it? Those are issues that aren't tested on ACT English. So that's one way to know just what is and what isn't tested. And the other thing is to look at the different answer choices. What changes between each of those different answer options? If it's changing a punctuation mark, well, then that question is probably testing punctuation. If it's changing a pronoun, well, that question is probably testing pronoun agreement. So that's how you can figure out what the issue is. Now, once you know what's being tested and what the problem is, get rid of any answer choice that doesn't fix the problem or that doesn't even address the issue. And of those that are remaining, plug them in. And you want to select the one that is grammatically correct. Has to be grammatically correct, right? But it also needs to be concise. Now, being concise means it's the shortest way of conveying the same information. It can't just be the shortest answer option because you, you know, took out half of the words and, and not, are not telling us anything anymore. But it's the most concise way, it's the shortest way of saying the same thing. And of course, what you're saying has to be relevant, it has to be on topic, it needs to be consistent with what's being discussed in the passage, it needs to be consistent with the style and tone that has already been written. Right, so that is how you're going to approach every question on ACT English. So let's review some of the issues that are on 
that part of the test. One issue that comes up quite frequently is subject-verb agreement. We know that a verb has to be conjugated to match up with a subject both in person and in number. Number meaning it's a singular versus plural. Person meaning, well, we, we don't want to personify things, so it has to be a verb that kind of matches up with, um, with the right uh, kind of object that's doing the action, and we also want to make sure we don't have any pronoun shifts. Now, this makes sense when our subject and verbs are right next to each other. The apple tastes delicious, apples taste delicious, tends to be, at least if we are a native English speaker or if we are a fluent English speaker, these tend to get our ears like on fire if I said, the apple tastes delicious. You're like, no, no, the apple tastes delicious. So when the subject and the verb are right next to each other, our ears tend to pick up on that problem. However, on the test, the subject and the verb aren't always right next to each other. And that is when you have to use your eyes. That's when you actually have to go back and say, okay, what is doing this action? What is the subject for this verb? Because they probably aren't going to be right next to each other. You'll have lots of other words in the way, either because of something like this, the chair with the cabriole legs is an antique. This is a prepositional phrase that's describing which chair we're talking about. But notice how we're talking about just one chair. What is an antique? The chair, not the legs. So that's why we have legs is, it's because the chair is. And so that is why we want the singular conjugation there. Another place where you find the subject and the verb separated are on opposite sides of a non-essential phrase demarcated out with commas. So anytime you have two commas and you have a verb right on the other end of that, Always go back when you see a verb underlined and double check what the subject actually is. Now, a couple things to know. If you have a compound using the conjunction and something that compound is plural, Celia and Taylor, they are in the running club. But if you use either or or neither nor, you don't have a plural that remains singular. Either Celia or Taylor is. Celia so is, or Taylor is, one of them is. Neither Celia nor Taylor is. No one is in the running club. So only and makes it plural. Now, another place you want to look for agreement is with pronouns. Pronouns also need to agree with whatever noun they are replacing. Uh, they need to match up in both person and number, first person, second person, third person, singular versus plural, and also with gender. Now, on the ACT, you can have uh, feminine, you can have she, Yvonne, she raised her hand, my sister, she raised her hand, he, uh, my brother, he, my father, he. We could have neutral, the rain, it. Or if it's unspecified, we have to use a singular unspecified phrase. So if a traveler is lost, I don't know who this traveler is, so I have to use the entire phrase he or she. They is always plural on both the ACT and in fact the SAT. So they is always plural on these types of tests. Now, this does differ from the way we often use it in spoken or colloquial English. If I say, oh, uh, you know, the cashier at the store, they gave me too much change back. You know, our ears don't seem that there's anything wrong with that. And there isn't anything wrong with that, that we use it that way all the time. But on the test, they, them is always going to be plural. So if you want to have an unspecified gender, you need to use he or she or him or her, the entire phrase of both of those singular pronouns. Now, modifiers also have to agree. So you can see there's lots of agreement issues here on the test. And a modifier is just any word or phrase that describes some other part of the sentence. We have different types of modifiers. One type is an adjective. Adjectives describe nouns. So Ian conducted an efficient lab experiment. Lab experiment is a noun. It was efficient. That's our adjective. But if I want to describe how Ian conducted his lab experiment, I would use an adverb. Adverbs describe everything else, <laughs> anything that's not a noun. So Ian conducted his experiment efficiently. And again, most adverbs have that L-Y. Um, not all, there are a few adverbs that don't. It was you know, a very 
strong wind. Very is an adverb in that case. Uh, but most adverbs have the L-Y. So remember, adjectives for nouns, adverbs for everything else. Uh, so let's put some of this into practice. Okay, now it may be tempting to start with the second sentence, but if you're following the Kaplan Method for ACT English, you want to start reading at the very beginning of the passage. And that's because there's going to be important context that will later be asked about in some other questions. Okay, so I'm going to give you a chance to read up through the first question. And if you know what issue, not what the answer is, but what the issue being tested here is, go ahead and let us know in the chat. Uh, we have a verb underlined. So when you have a verb underlined, there's a couple things you want to check for. One of the things you want to check for is agreement. What lacks in emotion? Well, we see that this verb is right next to the word lyrics. But in fact, that's not the subject that this verb is referring back to. It's music. The music that's being described as without lyrics. The music is lacking in emotion. So this isn't exactly, um, as Alicia says, this is a subject verb problem. So we have a singular subject, music. So we want a singular verb conjugation, is. And that is answer choice C. We don't want to add in an extraneous comma with answer choice D, so we'll go ahead and get rid of that one. And in this case, we can say, they feel that music without lyrics is lacking in emotion. Nice work. All right, so once you know the issue, remember, eliminate any answer choices that don't fix the issue, plug in your final answer choice, and make sure that it is grammatically correct, that you have introduced a new problem, and that is the shortest way of communicating that same information. All right, let's continue to read further. And again, once you know what's being tested here, what the issue is, let us know in the chat. Well, in this case, we have pronouns underlined. We have him or her. And we can see in our answer choices, we have the option of making that plural, them. We could change from an objective pronoun to a subjective pronoun, he or she, or we could make it singular, him. So we need to go back and say, okay, what, uh, what are these pronouns referring back to? I was among those who. So those who thought classical music wasn't for mm, those people, they are plural. So we want a plural pronoun here. And we only have one plural pronoun option. That's answer choice G. So we're going to get rid of F. Remember, him or her is the phrase that you use when you're talking about a singular person who just has an unspecified, uh, we don't know who they are. But in this case, we're talking about lots of people. All those people who don't think classical music is for them. So we are going to eliminate any of our singular options and we're going to choose answer choice G. This is indeed a pronoun agreement problem, as Alicia says, maybe pronouns, because we have pronouns underlined. And that's a good way that you can learn to identify the issues. All right, uh, let's take a look at another one here. Okay, now we have a different type of word underlined. I'm gonna give you a chance to read up through it. Go ahead and tell me in the chat, what do you think the issue being tested here is this time?
No. Well, this time we have the word usual underlined. Usual is a type of modifier. It's an adjective. I could describe, well, that's my, that's the usual route I take to school every day. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about how often something is scheduled. And that is a verb. Now I see a lot of you are telling me that I need to change this to answer choice D. And you are absolutely right. The answer here is usually, because we want to change this adjective into an adverb. So we're going to get rid of no change. We're going to get rid of B. Now both C and D fix the problem, right? They both change usual to usually. But C adds a bunch of unnecessary information. If something is usually done, it's almost always done. So we don't need to be redundant and say it's usually without exception. Well, that's the definition of usually. So we don't want to be wordy. We're going to get rid of answer choice C and we're just going to say D for usually. Nice work, everyone rocking this modifier question. I like it. Okay, let us now shift focus to math. So here is our Kaplan method for ACT math. Now, the very first thing you want to identify is what is the question asking? Now, you may think, well, well, of course I'm gonna read the question first, what else would I do? But on a word problem, and there are several word problems on the ACT, the question often isn't at the very beginning of the problem, right? Read the end first. Go to the very end, that last sentence. That is gonna tell you what task you're being asked to do. What are you being asked to find? What is the question asking you for? Identify that first. And in fact, underline it. Underline that question so that you don't lose track of what specifically you're being asked to do. Now you can go back to the beginning of that question and see what information you're being provided with. This is going to streamline your approach because you won't just read all this stuff and be like, blah, 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 like, oh, what do I do, what do, I do with all this information? I don't know. And then you see the question, you're like, oh, and then you gotta go back and read it again. No, so, you know, keep yourself efficient. Read the question first, go to the very end. What are you being asked to solve for? Now you can go back and read through the what information you're given and you can organize. You can say, okay, this is important, this is irrelevant, this is just fluff, or ah, really important stuff here I can use. And as you're reading that, you're going to pick a strategy. Now this is pick the best strategy. And best makes it seems like there's one objective best way to answer the question. But when we want you to pick the best strategy, we want you to pick the strategy that's fastest for you for that particular problem. Many questions can be solved in a lot of different ways. So pick the most strategic approach for you. For many of you, that may be just straightforward math, right? Math the way you learn it in math class. Other times, you may be able to strategically eliminate some answer choices and then plug in the remaining answer choices to figure out which one works. You can do something called picking numbers. If you have a lot of variables, variables in the question stem, variables in the answer choices, to avoid a lot of advanced algebra, you can pick a number, you know, let x equal two, plug it in, see what works. Or you can strategically guess. Guessing is a fine strategy for not only math, but the other sections of the test as well, because there is no guessing penalty. This means if you leave a question blank, you get no points. If you guess, you get no points. Uh, but if you guess, you have a chance of getting the question right. So you should never leave a question blank. Always guess if you are unsure, if you're running out of time. Or another thing to do here is if you see a question that's kind of bogging you down, stressing you out, skip it. Bubble something in and come back to it. No singular question is worth getting stressed out on the ACT because if you get stressed, if you start to rush, you'll start to make silly mistakes that you ordinarily wouldn't have made and now you're missing questions you should have gotten right, could have gotten right because you let a question bog you down. So never let a question be your quicksand. If you see a question that feels like it's taking a long time and you're starting to get worked up about it, just cut and run, guess and go. There's no reason to let any question get in your head. And finally, look at our step four here. This is the last step of the Kaplan method for math. Check that you answered the right question. Now, I don't mean did you bubble in, you know, question six where question six is on your answer grid. I mean, go back to what you underlined. Did you answer what the question required or did you do a lot of really good math and maybe you haven't finished it yet? 
There's a lot of logical stopping points on these multi-step problems, and the ACT knows where those stopping points are. Those become wrong answer choices, but very tempting wrong answer choices. So always double check that you finish the problem, that you've taken it all the way to the end before you bubble in your answer. Now, as I mentioned when we went to our ACT overview, geometry is a large component of ACT math. So we're going to do a bit of a geometry overview here, just brushing off the dust of some of these concepts that for some of you, it may have been a while since you have reviewed this for this. This may be uh, quite refreshing quite fresh. So let's take a look. Um, let's name these different angle types. Now, this is not a test-like question. You're not going to see a question on the ACT that says, you know, is this an acute angle? Is this an obtuse angle? But you do have to know the terminology in order to sometimes draw out a diagram or to know what the question is asking you for. So we have different types of angles. An acute angle is anything less than 90. Think of that hinge. It is closing. Uh, a right angle is perfectly perpendicular. It's that 90 degree. And then, of course, if we stretch this out, if it's any bigger than 90 degrees, we have an obtuse angle. Now, if angles form a line, a straight angle, that is 180 degrees. So every straight line is 180 degrees. Every group of angles that create a full revolution around a point of origin, like a circle, will have 360 degrees. Now, if two angles add up to 90 degrees, how would we describe the relationship between those angles? Who knows what this term is? Well, we would describe two angles as being complementary if they add up to 90 degrees. So complementary with an E, we're not giving, you know, like, oh, what a beautiful angle. I'm not giving them complements with an I, but they are complementary with that E, as Yusuf says. Great work. All right, I got another one for you. So if they add up to 180 degrees, then how would we describe the relationship between those two angles? if they form a straight angle when being put together. Oh. Any two angles that add up to 180 degrees we describe this relationship as being supplementary. Now, it's very important to note that complementary and supplementary angles don't have to be adjacent. Now, in my diagrams here, they are, right? The angles are touching each other. We can visually see that they create a 90 degree angle. We can visually see that they create a straight line. But supplementary angles, as Alicia and Yusuf have, have titled this, they don't have to be touching. In fact, when we see parallel lines cut through a transversal, you create lots of supplementary angle pairs, but many of them aren't touching. So when I have a supplementary angle diagram like this, so lines one and lines two are parallel, and that line that cuts across them, it transverses them, my, my line L here, that's called a transversal. It's just a line that cuts across two parallel lines. Now, I've created eight angles, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, but I've only created two angle measurements. I have created four acute angles that are all equal, and I've created four obtuse angles that are all equal. So every acute angle and every obtuse angle have the exact same angle measurement. Now, I can see visually that several of these create supplementary angle pairs or straight lines. Look at A and B they're going to create 180 degrees. And I've got one acute, B, and one obtuse, A. What this means is that any acute angle and any obtuse angle will be a supplementary pair of angles. I want you to take a look at this diagram, and I want you to provide Heather and I in the chat with a pair of angles that are supplementary but that are not touching. 
see how many of these we can come up with down here in the chat. All right, we are looking for an acute angle and an obtuse angle because any acute angle and any obtuse angle will add up to 180 degrees if they're not touching. So Karen gives us one here, angle A, that's the obtuse angle, and angle F, that's the acute angle. Nice. Uh, I see we got another one here, angle C and H, right? C is acute, H is obtuse. Good, uh, Kushi has angle G and D, right? G is acute, D is obtuse. Nicely done. So you can see there's lots of different angle pairs that are supplementary. Any acute angle and any obtuse angle are going to be supplementary at up to 180 degrees, even if they're not touching. Now, angles that are right across from each other are called vertical angles, and vertical angles are equal. So we can see A equals D, C equals B. E equals H, G equals F. Of course, we already knew this, right, because we know that all acute angles and all obtuse angles are going to be equal, but this will be true. Vertical angles will always be equal even when they're not in this parallel line system. So vertical angles are angles that are created when two lines intersect, and angles across from each other in that system are always going to be equal. Okay, so just my little tip here for you. All acute angles are equal and all of two angles are equal. Pick any one of them and they're supplementary. Now, this is the type of question you may see towards the beginning of the ACT math test. The questions get more advanced and more um, multi-step as you move from question one to question 60. So this would be uh, what would be considered a, a fairly introductory geometry question, but let's take a look at it. We see the points A, B, and C are on a straight line. We wanna know what is the measure of D, B, E. Okay. Well, what do what does the angle A, C equal? What is the measurement of a straight line? That's what we have to know in order to answer this particular question. So if I know that that's creating a straight line, then I know that all together they're going to equal 180 degrees. So I take 180, I subtract 40, I subtract, six, uh, I subtract 20, meaning I'm subtracting 60, and I end up with my final answer, or 120 degrees. As Karen has said here, this is answer choice D. We know this because angles A, B, D, D, B, E, and E, B, C are going to be three supplementary angles, meaning they're going to add up to 180 degrees. All right, let's take a look at another one. Now, this one is a little bit more difficult because we don't have any angle measurements this time. I'm going to give you a moment to think about this one. I don't want you to put, don't put an answer in the chat quite yet. I want you to tell me in the chat, what do you need to remember in order to figure out this problem? Not what your answer is. How are you going to solve it? We want to know A plus B plus C plus D. We don't have any angle measurements listed. This one is definitely a little bit trickier, but we know that we have ways of adding in angle measurements here. Look what Karen reminds us of. Well, an obtuse angle and an acute angle will always be 180 degrees when we have a transversal cutting across parallel lines, which is exactly what we have. Look at this. It says E, F, and G are parallel. H is a transversal. So that means this time we've not created just eight angles. We've created uh, 12 angles. And all of those acute angles are equal. 
all of those obtuse angles are equal, and any acute angle plus any obtuse angle is going to be supplementary or equal 180 degrees. So let's take a look at what we have. We want to know what is the value of all of these angles combined. Well, A and D are obtuse, B and C are acute. So for each pair of acute and obtuse angles, I'm going to have 180 degrees. So I've got two pairs of supplementary angles, add them together, and we have a grand total of 360 degrees. Well done thinking through this question. This one's definitely going to appear further on into the math test than that previous question. Okay. Let's look at another one here. Now, we are still dealing with this parallel line system. And in this case, we want to know what is the degree of x. All right, I'm going to give you a chance to think through this one on your own. When you think you've got it, feel free to put your answer in the chat this time. Very nice, very nice. Keep those answers coming in. So we know that every acute angle and every obtuse angle are going to be supplementary. Well, 40 is definitely acute. It's less than 90. So we already know that X has to be bigger than 90. It's, it's obtuse. So even if we were just blindly guessing, we could still eliminate A, B, and C because X is an obtuse angle. So even if we're just guessing, we'd guess between D and E. But look at this, we, can also, we don't have to guess. We know they're going to add up to 180 degrees, so we're going to take 180. We're going to subtract 40 from that, and we are going to get 140 as our final answer. I love it. Karen, Cushy, Alexa, Daniela, Alicia, Natalie, Cecilia, Leah, nicely done on this problem. All right, let's do another one. Okay, and again, I think this one... I don't want you to give me your answers yet. So I'm going to give you enough time to work through it. But what I want you to put in the chat right now, let's keep the chat spoiler free, is your thought process. And then once we've got the thought process, then I'll go ahead and give you a chance to put your actual answers in there. But no spoilers, no answers right now, just your thought process for question number seven. Hmm. Okay. Got a lot more going on with this one. And we don't have a diagram this time either. We want to know what could be the measure of LQR. Well, when you don't have a diagram and you're dealing with a geometry problem, one of the first things you can do is draw something out. When in doubt, draw it out. So we know a couple of things. We know that PQ is perpendicular to RS. Well, perpendicular means that I've got a 90 degree angle. So I'm going to draw a perpendicular line system and I'm going to add in, so there's PQ, and that's perpendicular to RS. And of course we see that Q is a point on RS and that matches up with my diagram right here. Now it says L is in the interior of PQS. So L is somewhere in here. Okay. 
I'm gonna give you a chance now, if you've thought this one through, go ahead and give me an answer down here in the chat if you'd like. So if you're ready to answer this question, you can now put your answers down there in the chat. Thank you so much for those of you who have already thought through this one for not spoiling it in the chat by putting your answer in there too early. So this question is asking for LQR. Well, if we drew in LQR, what type of angle would you be creating? So if L is somewhere in there, I could really pick any point for L. That's gonna be my angle. Well, I know it has to be bigger than 90 degrees, right? Because angle PQR is 90 degrees. So this has to be an obtuse angle, and there's only one obtuse angle option. That is answer choice F. Now, as Heather points out, notice this says which could be the measure. So we don't have to know what is the measure, we just have to know what could be. It's, that's why there's only one obtuse answer option. Nice work on this one. This was a little bit more of an ab abstract problem rather than a more exact problem. And you'll see a mix of those on ACT math. Well, we have one section left to talk about, and that is ACT science. So here's your method for ACT science. Now, like I said, most ACT science questions are going to be asking you about the charts, the graphs, the figures, and the data. So that's where you wanna go first. You wanna look at that passage, and you wanna take a look at those charts and figures, and you wanna ask yourself things like, what are, what are the variables? Right? What, what's on the x-axis? What's on the y-axis? What are the different labels? What's the title tell me? Do, do you see any trends? Is it going up? Is it linear? Is it not? Examine the figures provided and make note of those components. And then as you read each question, go back to the charts, graphs, and figures and predict your answer. Find proof using the data that you have, match your prediction up with an answer choice, and you're done. So let's take a look at this right here. So here we have our chart graph and figure. All right, so before we look at our answer, or our questions here, th there's going to be multiple questions about each chart graph and figure, by the way. You're gonna have six passages on ACT science, and they will have somewhere between six and seven questions apiece. So here's just one question related to this particular figure. Well, I can see here on the x-axis that I have speed, and my units are miles per hour. I can see on the y-axis that my dependent variable is stopping distance measured in feet. And I also have two other variables. I've got the two different methods, method one and method two. Okay, method one looks quite linear, method two is not. Uh, and so that's kind of what I can tell from this initially. And that's all I need to know about it initially before I looked at some of those questions. Now our question is according to figure one. Notice how this is asking you just to read the data from figure one, at which the following initial speeds, oh, that's good, that's our x-axis variable, so I'm feeling good there, is the value of d from one equal to that of method two. Well, if I want to know where they are equal, tell me in the chat, what is that going to look like on the graph? Well, if I want to know where these two methods are equal, I want to know where they are intersecting. So I'm looking for that point of intersection between method one and method two. Exactly, Karen, exactly so where they meet that intersection point. And I can see that right here. There it is, they intersect right there. So now that I know where their point of intersection is, I just wanna make sure that I'm answering the right question what is their initial speed? So let's drop a line down to the x-axis and let's see what that speed is. 30 miles an hour, there we go. Answer choice B, or 30 miles an hour. Now let's say this question, let's, let's get another question. Let's say it asked, what is the stopping distance at 60 miles an hour? Or what would be the stopping distance at 60 miles an hour? Well, notice how we don't have any data for that. But what do you think you could do? If you were asked for the stopping distance of either method one or method two at 60 miles an hour, 
how would you solve that question? And you don't have to really, you know, you're, you're being asked to predict, but you don't have to predict based on your old outside, your own outside knowledge. You can always continue whatever trends you see appearing in the data. So if you were asked for something like uh, a new data point, well, we can see here that method one is a line. We could just continue that line until we reach 60. Now, for method one, it's not really a line, but we can still continue the curve, right? And so we can say, eh, I might and I might predict, okay, so at 60 for method one, it's like maybe just a little lower than 200. And there'd be an answer choice that was right in that range. It wouldn't be exact. Your answer choices wouldn't be like 196, 194, 198. You know, it'd be like um, 150, 200, 300. I mean, and you can really see it, it'd be something maybe like 190. You know, so you'd pick something that's right there in that range. For method two, uh, for method one, we would be continuing this exponentially. So at 60 degrees, it looks like it might be about 400 feet something like that. But we definitely know it's gonna be much bigger than 300, and we could eliminate any answer choice that was 300 or less, and then there'd just be one answer choice that fit the trend. So absolutely continue the line, continue the trend, and that is how you can approximate these new data points. You got it. Those are the majority of questions on the ACT science test. Other questions may ask you about the methodology of an experiment, whether it's an independent variable or a dependent variable, or what the scientists changed. In this case, they were changing the initial speed and they were measuring the stopping distance, changing what's on the x-axis, measuring what's on the y. We'd call those the independent and dependent variables. All right. So, you know some methods and strategies that you can now apply to the test, and you know some of the content that's going to appear on the ACT. The key here is you can practice. You can learn what's on the test. You can familiarize yourself with how the test is structured, organized, what's going to be expected of you. That can decrease test-taking anxiety. You can go in there knowing exactly what to expect. To do that, create a study plan. So, now that you've learned some of these test strategies, put them into practice. Every time you practice, be sure to apply these. Ask yourself, what's the question? How am I gonna solve this? Go back, double check, did I answer the right question? When you're dealing with math, reading everything in the passage, not just moving around from question to question for English, and keeping a list of the issues that are tested. You don't just wanna go back and study your school books or your notes from school because while some of that content will appear on the test, especially for something like math or kind of English language conventions, you really want to be practicing with test-like practice so that you can not only practice the content, but can also practice the most efficient way of approaching those questions, eliminating, guessing, making sure that you're approaching the question in an efficient way, skipping over irrelevant information, making sure that you're focusing on just what matters. So follow study plan, access at least six full length practice tests. That's kind of a good um, aim. If you've done that, you're gonna have a really good sense of how the test is structured, those patterns. And of course, tap into your sources for expertise. Now, Karen has a question. Do you have any tips for the science section with the two scientists with differing viewpoints on an experiment? Of course we do, Karen. You want to divide and conquer. Now, you know there's going to be a section that provides you with multiple hypotheses or multiple points of view. So as you're reading each one, pay attention to what their point of view is. Write it down, take little notes. Okay, this is the author's point of view, this is the evidence the author uses. You don't need to memorize it, but you do need to, to be able to say, okay, here's what they disagree on, here's what the evidence, here's where their evidence is. Because right, then if you're asked about their evidence, you can go back quickly to that part of the passage. And by doing that, read one hypothesis or read one author, answer questions about that one hypothesis or that one author, go back to the other. That's going to kind of keep them separate so that you're not confusing the two. So as Heather says, divide and conquer. And most importantly, since you know they're going to ask you about the different viewpoints, when you're reading each one, 
that's what you're making note of. You are noting what their point of view actually is and write it down because that's going to retain it up here a little bit better. And that's also going to keep you from, you know, flipping them around or getting them confused. Um, in, in fact, that's a passage you can almost treat like a reading passage on test day, in fact. And you always want to read those passages first. So on the data passages, you're kind of skimming it. Then you're going to the questions there. You should, in fact, read the passage first, read the hypotheses, read the experiments, figure out the point of view first before you move on to those questions. Good question, Karen. And keep your questions coming here in the chat for Heather and myself. Uh, speaking of which, fellow, tap your sources of expertise. You have sources of expertise in front of you right now. So make sure that you are tapping my brain and tapping Heather's brain to make to get all of these uh, all these nuggets of information that you want to know out of us. Now, we have lots of different instructional options uh, that we offer here at Kaplan. So depending on what type of instructional uh, plan you are interested in, remember if you haven't already to fill out that, uh, that form that Petra's linked to because we are giving away some of these resources. That is one of our retail ACT books. It has lots of instruction as well as numerous practice problems and uh, kind of practice sessions there for you. We also offer digital books. Now, uh, live instruction, if you found this type of instruction very helpful, if you thought, wow, it was so great to have someone on camera explaining it to me and someone in the chat um, answering my questions, well, that is how our live online instruction works. In fact, Heather and I are both uh, live online instructors. We, we do these courses all the time. And that is going to enable you to get not only ACT strategy and practice, but also content um, instruction, kind of like we did with the geometry and with the English. Now, you can also get a personal ACT coach if you're like, where do I even start studying? We do offer three one-on-one -on -one coaching hours with our Prep Plus products, which is going to take, you can take some practice tests, have a coach work with you to figure out your strengths, your areas of opportunity, put together a personalized study plan for you that you can follow along. If you're finding you need a little bit of uh, kind of brush up on some of those foundations of math, we offer pre-college math foundation resources, nine full-length practice tests. I mean, it is literally you can have as much resource, as much practice as you want. There's so so many practice opportunities. Uh, more than anything, we offer confidence. So confidence is key. We want you to be confident that you know exactly what to expect on test day. Um, we also have something called the ACT channel. Uh, this is something that is. Think of it as kind of like the Netflix of test prep. So we offer live sessions. You can drop into those. You don't have to pre-register. You just, you know the schedule. You show up. You get to uh, participate in the class. But there's also on-demand resources as well. So there's also pre-recorded structure instructional videos you can access whenever you like. And of course, these are also taught by our top live online instructors. This also allows you to really hone in on those areas you need focus on. So like, I just want to focus on geometry or I just want to focus on trigonometry or I just want to focus on punctuation, or I just want to focus on science passages or data interpretation. You can do that. You can just focus in on those sessions versus the others. Now, Daniela asked a great question. Is setting for the ACT the same as for the SAT? It's very similar. When you are preparing for one test, you are inadvertently learning a lot of the strategies and skills that cross over to the other test. Now, not 100% of that go crosses over. So for instance, there's not a lot of geometry on the SAT, but there's a lot of it on the ACT. So that content doesn't carry over, but the Kaplan methods for approaching the different sections do. So if you have become very efficient at, say, the Kaplan method for ACT English, that's almost the exact same thing. That, that's the same strategy that's gonna work for you for the for the SAT writing and language. Um, so there's a lot of crossover, right? Conventions of English language don't change between the tests. How to interpret a reading comprehension passage doesn't change between the two tests. Um, you know, algebra doesn't change between the two tests, nor does the strategic approach between the two. So, so yes, in fact, there's a lot of carryover. If you're studying for one, you're also preparing for the other. And then you just have to take into account those little nuances. The ACT has that science test, which the SAT doesn't. The SAT has some grid in questions in math and some math content that the ACT doesn't and vice versa. So there's a little bit of difference. Uh, maybe about 20% of the content is different between the two tests. 
Great question, Daniela. And, and again, you know, Heather has been putting writing this link in the chat. That's a fantastic link to go to the SAT versus ACT comparison on captest.com. We do also offer uh, a comparative practice test. It's it's a combo turbo test, so you don't have to sit there for six hours. You can, in fact, get a pretty good sense of both of those tests in, in about three and a half hours of testing, which allows you to compare, you know, which one do you feel more comfortable with? Which one do you feel better with? Uh, that's another great way to figure out which test is right for you. Um, in terms of course types, we have different types of instruction. Live online through an interactive classroom tends to be uh, really one, you can you can access this in your pajamas. You don't even have to like put shoes on to go get some instruction that can be very useful. If you're someone who just wants to brush up a little bit, uh, self-paced with a course book, you can work through some recorded instructional videos, get yourself that way. Again, if you want some one-on-one -on -one help, we offer private tutoring and coaching as well. Everything includes a personalized SMART report based on your practice test results. This is the number one thing when people say, where do I start studying? Well, I don't know. I'd have to figure out where you're at right now to help you figure out where to start. You want to know your strengths, and you also want to know specifically where you're losing points. So you don't just want to say, I want to study math. Like, oh, that's, that's way too big, right? Where do you even start? But if you know, okay, I'm really good with linear equation questions, I'm not good with systems of equation questions. I'm really good with triangles, but I'm not great with circles. Like, then you can start to figure out where to focus that's going to fine tune your study approach rather than just doing question after question after question and not really knowing if you're tackling the areas you need to or not. So our SMART reports break this down for every practice test within each section, you have a nice nuanced sense of where to go. Uh, and here's just a nice overview of our different ACT course options. You can see they go all the way from self-paced, which is just pre-recorded lessons, all the way through private tutoring, which is 100% one-on-one, um, just completely with your own personal um, your, your personal tutor, personal instructor there. The ACT Prep and the ACT Prep Plus tend to be our, our most popular um, options. Both of these include the live lessons. So 18 um, instructional hours covering every asset of the course, as well as access to the ACT channel. And the Prep Plus option has those three one-on-one -on -one coaching hours, as well as access to the SAT resources. So if you're considering prepping for both tests, that could be a really good option for you because then you would in fact get practice tests and resources for both. So almost like doubling the amount of resources that you get, as well as having those one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions to help put together a study plan for you. Right. Ultimately, we just want you to be confident. And so the one thing, if you take nothing away from this session, I want you to know that you can improve your score with practice and with the right strategic approach. So you can practice, you can learn, you can study, and you can improve your ACT score. Uh, we guarantee it. In fact, we guarantee this is possible because you can prepare for it just like any other test. So let us know what further questions that you have for us. Uh, but I want you to thank you for joining, uh, for joining myself, for joining Heather and Petrus and I here uh, for this Strategies for Success session. And, and let us know what further questions you have. And of course, you can find a lot of great information at captest.com as well. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to give one more plug to make sure that you go out and fill out that form in the booth if you have not already to be entered to get some free Kaplan test resources. Best of luck as you prepare and study for your college and university entrance exams. And uh, we hope to see you soon in one of our future events. Take care, everyone, and have a great rest of your week.